Okay, welcome everyone to tonight's uh, Wisdom Dharma Chat out there in the internet land and also present with us tonight. Thank you for all joining us. Tonight's a very, very special night because we're joined by Kyabje Kalu Rinpoche. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Rinpoche. Thank you. Uh, Rinpoche is here because we're filming an online course. And so we're very excited about that. It's a, a course about, well, it's a course based on this book, Luminous Mind. And this is a book that we published, Wisdom Publications published many moons ago. Um, and it was a collection of the previous Kalu Rinpoche's teachings. And so we asked Rinpoche to um, do some teachings based on those books. And so we've been here um, today, you know, the last few days mm -hmm. sort of filming Rinpoche as Rinpoche gave these amazing teachings, blowing our minds. And Rinpoche's been teaching on all sorts of things from dream yoga to um, illusory bodies. He's going to talk about Bardo. It's just covering all of, all of basically Vajrayana teachings. And I was so surprised at these amazing teachings. And so then I was thinking, well, what are we going to talk about tonight? And so with discussions with Rinpoche, we thought we'd talk about um, yoga, Naguna's yoga. And um, then I and Rinpoche kindly offered to demonstrate some of the yoga. So tonight we're going to see Rinpoche demonstrating some of the Naguma yoga poses. Yes. And um, so first we're going to have a little bit of a conversation about uh, the yoga in the Tibetan tantric tradition. Then Rinpoche will uh, give us a demonstration. Yes. And then everyone will have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so and online as well. So in online in Zoom you have a Q&A panel. And so you can, uh, you can press that and then ask your question there. And then I'll have those questions. So both uh, present or the audience present and also online will be able to ask Rinpoche um, some questions. So there's a very precious opportunity. Yes. Um, so Rinpoche, I want to start with, um, since, since we're going to talk about like physical yoga. Okay. Um, one thing you're amazing at is really mapping out the tantric path. Okay. And working out and, and explain very clearly how everything fits together, mm -hmm. like a map of Vajrayana. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to start off with asking, these yoga, these physical postures, mm. where does that fit within, you know, the tantric path? Okay. Especially to, to all of you, the wisdom team and our participant here, and as well as the online participant, thank you for joining and being here. The tantric yoga course it's not a singular practice um, and as a buddhist practitioner we have to understand a basic little bit of foundation of theravada a little bit of foundation of mahayana and then of course tantrayana becomes the vehicle of express mm -hmm. right so but the vehicle of express and to reach enlightenment in a single lifetime comes down to uh, how you understand it how you initiate yourself and how you start, how you understand all the different elements combining together. And of course, it's not done by learning by oneself. It's also guided meditation, guided instruction. And the yoga comes somewhere in the middle. In the beginning, of course, it always starts with a refuge, as all the Buddhist tradition, whether it's a Nyingma, Satya, Gaju, Gelug, Shampa, you know, whichever the tradition may be. It is a common foundation. Even we are known as a Tibetan Tantrayana Buddhist branch, even though we practice all the branches, mm. um, but widely known as a Tantric Buddhist practitioner. Uh, in the beginning, it starts with the refuge, purification. Uh, in the Shampa lineage, in the Nyugumas lineage, the purification is not based on the Vajrasato, uh, deity. It is based on the MTR visualization, um, based on that very much minimalist visualization, uh, very much to do with less color, less object as possible to begin with. Mm. And that's where the Niguma tradition starts from. And there's a preliminary stage. Uh, and then after that, uh, of course, there's a deity practice. The deity practice is very important because the whole purpose of the deity is not to gain miracle or magical uh, powers or foreseeing or predicting the future. That may be the possibility, uh, 
this gift and this experience may come, but you have to let it go because you should not be distracted by little experience. You should reach to the ultimate goal. So the yoga uh, comes after the uh, establishing yourself of the deity practice. The purpose of the deity practice is that you kind of distance yourself from the senses. Right now, we are very much attached into how I look, how I sound, how I, how, how I am perceived, and what kind of impression I should give to others, which is the ordinary human being, the way we function. So when you practice the deity, you're letting go of all the ordinary habits, you're letting go of all the ordinary fixation, and then you are entering into a subtle stage of mindfulness, the subtle stage of awareness. Once you establish that, then it brings some form of uh, uh, clarity in mind. But before you start the deity, it is very important to start doing a shamatha, calm abiding meditation, analytical meditation, just because I teach yoga doesn't mean that you prioritize less uh, in when it comes to calm abiding meditation or analytical meditation. Mm -hmm. These are the procedure. Mm -hmm. But then when you practice deity, then you naturally, over the time, not instantly, over the time, all the important and the fixation to the senses tend to reduce over the time. As that is reduced, an awareness overwhelms that. And then the clarity uh, maintains it. And then you have the subtle body experience, not because you grab the idea of the subtle body, but rather you uh, revealing yourself. I like the idea of revealing yourself because many people, they have this idea of reaching somewhere, getting from someone, somebody else putting a statue on the top of your head. And then all of a sudden you realize it, mm -hmm. you know? And we have that idea, and it's great. There's nothing wrong with it. <clears throat> but you have to understand that yoga is about channeling. So channeling is a very simple foundation from my understanding. When you have the uh, non-fixated, some form of awareness and clarity, and then in order to reinforce the yoga comes to a place. Yoga does not replace the deity practice, but rather reinforce your clarity, your awareness, and then it strengthen your foundation and whichever the deity practice that you may be doing. Mm -hmm. Like an example, when you maintain your yoga practice, you bring such a great awareness to your breath, to your physical movement and your awareness that even sometime when you read the teachings of Milarepa or the teachings of Nigruma, you tend to have instant devotion as, a, as in the peak of your experience. And that is a form of clarity that you tend to develop. If you don't have the yoga or the deity practice simultaneously combining together, then time to time, maybe there's a tragic story that you hear and there, and then you have a little bit of tears. A little bit like when you watch a sad movie and doesn't do much to you. Bit of emotion here and there, but doesn't do much to you. But then if you don't have awareness and just reading the biography of all the great masters and teaching and having a little bit of tears and a little bit of overwhelming emotion, doesn't change much. But then if you maintain your yoga practice with awareness of your breath, because yoga is about awareness of the breath. It's not about the moving around. It's not about cleansing your negative energy only. It's about you know, having awareness of every breath that you take mm -hmm. and not keeping the gap between the sequence as well. Like an example, when we practice, we have this idea, I'm at the first sequence, second sequence, mm -hmm. and we justify the distraction in between yeah. in like one session. Okay, I finish one session. Oh, se second session. Now I'm starting. So we have this idea that I am starting now. I am ending now. I am finishing the practice. Mm. You have to understand that the Dharma practice never finishes until you reach enlightenment. Mm. So we have to let go of this idea of I am finishing my first session, but rather continuation. 
But in the beginning, it can be difficult and overwhelming to maintain that. So therefore, sequence, break, session, break, to keep in order is good. And the yoga has to reinforce the deity practice. The deity practice has to reinforce the yoga practice. And then when you have this contribution of the breath and the mind synchronizing together, like an example, when you conquer your air, you conquer your mind. You know, so you do not conquer the mind by itself by accident. First, you have to conquer your air. Doesn't mean that being able to keep very long. It simply means being able to maintain with as subtle distraction as possible. Once you maintain that, and then recognizing the nature of the mind, having a very immense compassion from the bottom of your heart. Naturally, all these are beautiful experience, and all these are there to experience it at that stage. You know, because at that stage, when you have this contribution of awareness, you have created some form of gap from the fixation. When you created a, some form of gap from the fixation, you have created a gap from the illusion of the ego, illusion of our self-attachment. When you created that gap, you see nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. When you see nothing but the truth, then you have the immense, limitless compassion from the bottom of the heart. Naturally, even you don't like to think about it. Mm. But by that time, you have no judgment about you like to think about compassion or you don't like to think about compassion. No. So that's that. Very nice, Mabuchi. So yeah. we start with purification. Yeah, so. And then um, engage, obviously, Shamatha Vipassana, mm. but engage in deity yoga, mm. deity practice. And the deity practice helps us to, it seems you're saying that uh, deity practice helps us to uh, have less fixation to the sen senses, objects of the senses. Yes. And then there's this clarity that arises and almost like a connection with the subtle body that helps us with the yoga practice in, in some way, the mm -hmm. deity practice. Through that, the deity practice is linked with the yoga practice mm -hmm. through this um, uncovering, did you say, of the... Unraveling. Unraveling yeah. of the... Um, <clears throat> of the yeah unraveling of the of you know, of this finding of the subtle body mm -hmm. right yes yes and then um then the actual yoga practice you said it reinforces the deity practice mm -hmm. and so how how does the yoga practice reinforce the deity practice mm. the way it reinforces the deity practice is basically our body is um, combination, let's say, combined of the few elements, Satchu, Melon. Yeah. Uh, so our whole physical level, in the physical form, you know, we have a channel. Mm. So we have a channel, but our channel has a lot of knot, a subtle knot, not necessarily uh, like an x-ray machine can scan it, yes. because if you can, you know, scan the subtle channel, that means... Uh, you can recognize where the nature of the mind is uh, at that stage already. Exactly. But so therefore, the subtle channel is simply a phrase I under, my, from my understanding rather than the existence of the channel in our body. Yeah. Mm, so <clears throat> that's the first thing that you have to understand. Many people, they have, are very attached to this idea of I have chakra here. I have chakra here. I have chakra here. I have a channel over here, yeah. you know, my right channel. The Uma, yeah. the Roma, and Changma. The color looks like this. That shape looks like that. It is placed over here from the bottom, you know, placing upwards. That's where the heat comes. That's where the bliss comes. Yeah. It's great to have that ambition to learn and to study. But over the time, you have to let go of that. You know, over the time, you have to just simply live with the experience. You know, so what I'm trying to explain is that... <clears throat> We breathe 21,000, you know, knowing or without knowing. So what the yoga does is that you do, do all the yoga posture and practice. What you do is that in, from the physical aspect and the mental aspect combined together is that you purify the negative air into a positive air. Mm -hmm. Now, negative air doesn't mean that to make you have unhappy all the time and aggressive and emotional. It doesn't mean that. Negative in this stage, it simply means absent from the clarity. 
you know. So the positive air or the wisdom air, Yishikilo, mm. is simply known as a, you know, people think people think too much about oh how the wisdom air feels like and all that. None of it matters if you don't practice. Mm. You know, the theory is good, but the practice matters combined together. So you have to by untying the channel, then the air and the essence that passing through becomes more accessible. As the essence and uh, that it becomes more accessible throughout the channel, and then our mind, you know, to be in the state of clarity, the potential is far more greater. Therefore, it is reinforcing the deity practice. Mm -hmm. Because I practice six arm mahakala, mm -hmm. chakra sambara, as you know, five tantric deities. And then I did practice before the yoga, and I I tested not intentionally, but by accident, mm -hmm. before and after yoga. And after yoga, you know, when I practice deity, it tends to bring far more clarity. Because what you do with the yoga practice is that the first few sequences, what it does is that it releases the adrenaline you know, in your body just by the uh, seven times of different movement. Mm -hmm. It releases adrenaline. And then over the time, somewhere in the middle sequence, then you tend to develop a blissful experience. And then if you're a practitioner, you turn that blissful experience into non-duality state of mind. And if you're not a Buddhist practitioner, then you just simply enjoy that. Mm -hmm. and that's the, my idea and the trick mm -hmm. to bring people to Buddhism more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so remember, Chet, these uh, postures at the beginning are releasing this adrenaline. Yes. Right, <clears throat> probably give you a lot of clarity in a way. Really? I, I wouldn't say a clarity. I would say just a generant. It just brings, like an example, you're worried about a lot of things. You're thinking about a lot of things. Um, like my personal example is that you're passing through the subway. Uh, somebody insulted you for no reason. Mm -hmm. Doesn't know who you are. You know, doesn't know that how, how great master I am. <laughs> 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 and insulted me and i was like okay you know and then as i was sitting in the uh, in my friend's you know studio his artist sculpture studio um when i was uh, sitting in the studio and i was thinking how come this person insulted me to me if it happens in asia oh my goodness <laughs> yeah. you know uh, it's beyond imagination you know and and then, of course, you have that kind of a discomfort thoughts, isn't it? Like you have an ego, you have an attachment. And then after I start doing the exhale, inhale yoga, and all of that thought, you know, uh, vaporish, you know, vape, you know, vaporize right away mm. uh, after like seven, eight, you know, sequence uh, of the same posture. So that's what it does. So you at the first stage, it blocks everything away from all the subtle or oh, oh, ordinary. Uh, fixation, like an example, he said that, she said that, I have to do this, I have to do that. So the first beginning of the few sequence that kind of vaporize all of that mm. and distraction. And then, you know, then the only at the middle stage of the sequence, then the clarity start to appear okay. only at that time, not in the beginning. Okay, and then the, the bliss will come with the clarity? The bliss will come with the clarity combined together you know, somewhere around the end. Yeah. Because the, at the end sequence is more to do with how to dispel the agitation, anger, and the attachment and desire. Mm. So these are the seen as a subtle cleansing. Yeah. So the first stage is seen as a physical form cleansing. Yeah. Second stage is uh, uh, more to do with untying the channel knots and purifying the essence and all. And then the third stage is being able to experience the subtle, such as our negative emotions, to the point of non-existence, at least at that stage of practice. So we actually use these uh, experiences, mm -hmm. an experience of bliss, to access this uh, non-dual experience. Is that is that right, Mr. Chay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So in some ways, could we say that um, we do yoga practice to experience, have these experiences? especially the experience of bliss, mm. to have the experience of non-dual. 
mm -hmm. experiences. That, could we say that? You can put it like that, or you can also say a beginning of um, stopping the cycle of illusion. Stopping the cycle of illusion. illusion. Yes, okay. because like in like in the West, everybody talks about the dream yoga. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about the bardo experience. I had the bardo-like experience, mm -hmm. and um, everybody talks about the dream yoga. Everybody talks about emptiness. I have no disagreement with you. Yeah, but only way to one of the way, let's say, one of the way to achieve all of that is to conquer your body and mind first. Without conquering the body and mind first, you cannot achieve none of it. All that is imagination, a beautiful imagination. There's nothing wrong with it. You have aspiration to practice all of it. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you want to practice bardo, you have to conquer that state of mind as a dream yoga. In order to develop the dream yoga, you need to develop the illusionary body and mind experience. If you want to experience the illusionary body and mind, it doesn't mean that you become delusional. Okay, There's a big distinction between becoming a delusional mm -hmm. and recognizing everything as it is, as a relative truth. Mm -hmm. right? And, but in order to recognize that strength of the mind, that, that form of clarity, to recognize the illusionary body and mind, you need to practice Dhumma. Dhumma. The yoga, yeah. the heat generating practice, the physical and the mental combined together with all the potential gathering together. So the yoga practice supports the tumor practice, the inner fire practice, which supports your um, you know, touch in touch with the illusory sort of body, yes. which helps you with your dream yoga, exactly. which, without which you cannot really do bardo yoga. Right? No, you yeah. cannot. So bardo yoga, because the very existence of the bardo is projection of thoughts that is beyond our control. Mm -hmm. And that is a very cause of the suffering of the bardo. Mm -hmm. And not just wake, not waking up from it, mm -hmm. but also not having the awareness of whatever we are projecting. Mm -hmm. Like an example, a person who has a great traumatic experience will never be in peace instantly after that he or she gone through an extreme traumatic experience. They will live in that memory again and again again and again, and every decision they make will relate to the traumatic experience they had, mm. right? So that is, that is in our physical level of experience that we can admit, at least. And then, like an example in a dream, you know, at least we can say, ah, that was a bad dream. Mm. That wasn't real. Mm. But in the state of the bardo, you don't have a choice at that stage. You don't say, I have a traumatic experience. At that stage, it's no longer a traumatic experience. It's just a the body doesn't exist anymore, but you still have all the projection of fears and uh, on different unpleasant things mm -hmm. to summarize. But in order to relate to that bardo experience, you need to experience the dream yoga. Mm -hmm. Because in the stage of the dream yoga, in the, all the elements, sachu, melung, mm -hmm. you know, the dissolving stage is exactly the same as the, the bardo stage when we enter the death. But the only difference is that the pace is different. In the state of the dream, we do not see the, the mother nature clear light. Mm -hmm. In the state of the Bada, we see the mother nature clear light. So in the state of the, the dream, we just don't see the mother nature clear light. But other than that, all the element, we are able to witness it if we have a subtle awareness. Mm -hmm. you know? So in order to develop that subtle awareness, you need to develop non-fixated, non-fixated, uh, to all the different kind of attraction, lust, all that kind of things from the, the world of senses, right? Because if you are in very much overwhelmed by a world of senses, let alone the clarity, you cannot even have time to meditate. Mm -hmm. You know, By saying that, it doesn't mean I have conquered my mind, mm -hmm. okay? I'm still struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to be clear, just because I share my experience doesn't mean that I've achieved it. Mm -hmm. So I know a little bit in terms of experience. But you, but Rinpoche, you've spent so much time mm. practicing these practices mm. and also in three-year retreat as well. Yeah. So is this what you were doing in three-year retreat, this um, daily yoga practice and this yoga? Uh, is that the sort of thing you were doing every day? And, and what sort of you know, signs did you get that, okay, this is worthwhile doing? It, just to be, uh, you know, just uh, simply to share with all of you, uh, I was very lazy in the retreat. <laughs> And I was like, you wouldn't 
Even imagine, you know, you would imagine the Kalurumbache, reincarnation of the great master, somewhere in a mountain in a snowy land and doing a retreat and a almost half naked yoga, <laughs> you know, not eating for days and months. And you may have that kind of imagination. Good. Keep on dreaming. <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm that. Yeah. Um, there was a time that a uh, lot of distraction um, because you enter to a completely different uh, environment. You know, you go from playing football, going to the forest, uh, buying some snacks from the stores to to the place where you cannot get any outside access. Mm -hmm. You know, even you get a newspaper that's like so much information. And if you get a small piece of newspaper, because people, when they send you a gift, they wrap it up <laughs> in that newspaper. So I, I read a little bit of torn newspaper and trying to catch up with the world. <laughs> Even I'm not interested in the, the cricket, it becomes interesting <laughs> because <laughs> you have nothing else to read. <laughs> but um, what really encouraged me was the Niguma's teaching. Mm. And the Chumbu Nanjo's teaching, um, and then also the journey they had, um, because nowadays we have given a roof over our head, we are given a text in the front of us, you know, a place to do retreat and practice. You won't starve to death, um, but their condition that what they had to go through is like experimental stage, isn't it? Like, of course, the teachings of the Buddha was there. That's not experimental stage, but. You know, they had to come all the way from Tibet, crossing the border of Nepal, mm. and then entering to the West Bengal, going through all the climate differences, and have no, you know, uh, translation app. You know, so you have yeah, to, little, you have to go with the broken language, and then and you're bringing back with a lot of spiritual teachings about enlightenment. You know, can you imagine? Like the, you have to go with the broken language, not knowing Nepali language, not knowing, you know, Indian language, mm. but you have to become that bridge and then you know they're living their whole life for that uh, purpose and that gave me the inspiration and uh, and then also previous color which is dharma activity mm. and all of that combined together it, you know it shake my heart a little bit mm. yeah so yeah a little bit of practice really helped because i find that solitude retreat is very important because without solitude, you know, we can say we are very modern human being living in the 21st century, and, but the mind functions exactly the same as before. So therefore, sometimes the method has to be traditional. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the method can be adopted to circumstance. Mm -hmm. So I think balancing both is important. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, it's nice when you talk about devotion and you previously made the connection between clarity and devotion. Mm -hmm. And uh, almost devotion is like a form of clarity, right? Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, yes. Devotion is... Uh, <clears throat> many people, when they think about the devotion, they think that uh, devotion is something that you must do. It's absolutely something that you must do. But is it something that you must force yourself with it? Absolutely not. Because you cannot have a devotion, you know, just by itself naturally. Maybe for some individual, like an example, Gamboba hear the word, the name of Milareba for the first mm -hmm. time, then there's a tears, sense of joy beyond control. You know, so like that kind of a circumstance may happen. Uh, but please don't consider yourself as one. <laughs> you know, if, if you're one of them, you become one of them. No need to search and be that. Uh, so Devotion is not something that you have to force yourself to have it. Uh, but faith in Dharma is far more important. When you have a faith in Dharma, the teachings of the Lord Buddha, and then you reduce the fixation. When you reduce the fixation and the illusion of the attachment, you know, not over, not all of it, but as you progress of on reducing it, and then sense of you know, less attachment tend to revealed by itself as that quality reveals. Mm -hmm. And then the way you see the teachings of the Buddha, the way you see the teachings of the, of the great master becomes far more pure all by itself. At that stage, you're no longer struggling whether you need to have a devotion or not. Mm -hmm. 
that doesn't become the part of the question or doubt. But so therefore, everybody needs to focus on the teachings of the Buddha based on the love, com loving compassion, as His Holiness Dalai Lama always uh, speaks about around the world. Right? His Holiness Dalai Lama is a highly realized being. Uh, he can talk about so many different things, but yet when it comes to the engagement to the general public, he always emphasizes on loving compassion, our Lokiteshwara practice. You know, so practice can be very simple. Mm. Practice can be very simple, but based on the compassion. When you practice compassion, not to the point where you have to go to the street to do something, you don't need to prove to anybody. You don't need, it's not about proving to anybody. When you practice compassion based on the visualization, the strength of the fixation tend to reduce by itself as you enter as a habit, let's say, uh, you know, in Tibetan, Tosa means positive accumulation, Tibajawa means dispelling or dissolving the negativity, isn't it? So uh, the negativity will not disappear just by knowing that is a negative. This negative will only dissolve only when you accumulate the positivity. And how you accumulate positivity, what practice you do matters. So the practice we should choose is a practice of compassion. Mm. That is the opposite of our self-fixation. And then when you practice compassion based on the visualization, not challenging yourself in the real world, okay? <laughs> uh, my insurance doesn't cover that. <laughs> uh, so when you develop that uh, compassion, uh, based on the visualization again and again, and slowly by slowly, little by little, you are able to resist overwhelming negativity, mm. step by step, as you overcome slowly, slowly. And then the clarity in mind tend to develop, and then compassion genuinely uh, becomes your new version of reality, and then also the devotion to the great master, the teachings, far more become accessible to your heart. Mm. So faith to the Dharma, then devotion will naturally come. Yes, yes. When it's time. Yes, yes. Of course, you can respect to all the great master. You can receive all the teachings, whether it's from the Nyingma Satya Kajuge, Luchon, Shamba, whichever the tradition may be. But don't force yourself, don't force yourself to be compassionate. Yeah. Practice compassion, and the result will come eventually by itself. And just like that, focus on the clarity of your mind. And then the devotion to the authentic master. You will see it, you will sense it, mm. then you will devote at that time by itself. Very nice. Yeah. And Rinpoche, you seem to have this special connection with Nguma, mm. obviously a lineage holder of the Shangpa Kagyu. Mm. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, who is Nguma, mm. sort of your sort of connection and feeling towards Nguma, mm. and then since we're going to move into seeing a little bit of the yoga practice, mm. um, a little bit about what is the Nguma's yoga. Mm. Uh, regarding the Nguma, there's not so much known about her. Um, the only thing that is known about her is that she is a highly realized being, equal to green Dara and the white Dara, that sort of a level of realization being. That's number one. Number two is that she is the elder sister of Naropa. Mm. So Naropa, of course, followed the Telopa. Mm. And the Niguma, she followed Saraha. And then eventually she declared, she said, I have no human guru. Mm. I have only one guru. And that is the Buddha himself, the Vajadara himself, that has uh, come to my presence. Uh, so that is her declaration in terms of the level of realization that she had. That's the uh, that's the origin of that. And the third is that her lifestyle. Uh, she is known as a Kandroma, but many people in, nowadays, when they think about the Kandroma, they think it's something to do with the consort, you know. Mm. And that is a wrong misunderstanding, uh, because being a Kandroma has nothing to do with being a consort. You know, it's not, it's about being, you know, being Kandoma, Dhaka, Dakini, all these are highly realized being, less dependent, non-attached, uh, highly realized yogi and Mahasiddha, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So she lived uh, very much in the wild. And when she met Chungpo Nanjo, and uh, Chungpo Nanjo was directed to that forest because of the other great masters in Bodhigaya at that time. And when they first met, and then Yuguma said, uh, 
what are you doing here? I'm a cannibalist. I'm going to eat you alive. Yeah. And my friends are going to come. They're going to definitely eat you alive. So you should run away. Mm. So definitely uh, it shows that she is not uh, hair brushing every day, <laughs> doing makeup every day. You know, and definitely she's not in that uh, yoga pant or, <laughs> or anything like that. She's definitely living just like a many other great Mahasiddha yeah. and the great yogi, a little bit like a solitude life and also in a cremation site as well, where people don't bother to come in the wild forest. Uh, and my relation to the Niguma is, of course, it goes all the way back to uh, previous Kalurambache and the previous Kalurambache with the previous Kalurambache and then goes all the way back to the uh, the first Jamgrim Kondalurataye and the Dharanatha and all that teachings and the transmission that is passed down uh, to me over the time. So mm -hmm. that is my relation in terms of the, the empowerment. But uh, from my heart, connection was in the retreat. Mm -hmm. When I read the biography, when I actually practiced, that was the time that I told myself I'm going to uphold this lineage and bring it back alive and make it, uh, you know, what do I say, maintain as it should, mm. uh, as a, one of the Buddhist branch in terms of the lineage and the practice and the yoga. Mm. That's that. Very nice. Thank you, Renke. You're welcome. And, um, and you said in retreat you had a sort of, you know, that those practices came easy for you in a way compared to other practices, right? Yes, it is. Practices. So there's some connection. Yes, I basically became a nationalist uh, right wing. <laughs> <laughs> so I read the biography, but uh, all the other practice that I uh, did in the Niguma, especially I like very much her teachings mm -hmm. because the way she expressed her teaching is so much loving, so much caring, almost knowing that you are going to read that. You know, that sense of presence, because there's so many other different figures who just write things. There's no sense of personality in it. There's no sense of heart to heart connection to it. It's like, OK, you do this, you do that. After that, three times of this, you do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so there's a lot of guideline, but lack of human bond. So when I read the Niguma's teaching, there's a human bond mm. from her to her student. And when I reflect that, you know, in terms of her quality and realization, but also her character, you know, and that made me, uh, you know, very much uh, uh, cherish the teachings of the Niguma. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, based on that and all the other practice that I do, based on the Niguma's teaching, it was relatively easy, and I'm, I'm very fortunate for that. Mm -hmm. So one last question, Rinpoche. Often these teachings are considered very secret. Mm -hmm. and so I was wondering like, uh, how you think about secrecy. What is the role of secrecy? Vajrayana is often associated with you know, the secret teachings. Mm -hmm. So what does secrecy mean in terms of Vajrayana in this, this context? I mean, you can search on the internet. There's nothing much secret left. <laughs> yeah. You can say, I'm going to keep a secret, but there's nothing much left. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, Niguma herself, uh, she mentioned, she said, my lineage, my five jewels of Niguma's teaching, and the six yogas of Niguma should kept secret until the seventh generation. That includes her. She said, you have to keep the secret until the seventh generation. After the seventh generation, then the seventh lineage holder is permitted to give to the public. Mm. You know, whether it's the five jewels of Niguma, whether it's all the teachings. And so that's, that is the historical origin. Due to that, like an example, the second Dalai Lama, His Holiness Dalai Lama, was born in the Shambhagaju family. Mm. And his father was a retreat master overseeing the small temples and the retreat centers and so on. As he reached the teenager age, he was already influenced by his father. And then he was recognized as a reincarnation of Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. So that has the influence on the Gilupa lineage as well. Mm -hmm. And then also during the seventh, after the seventh lineage holder, and there was also a time where, uh, how do you call it, uh, Chanang lineage, 
like an example, Taranatha revived many, many teachings because many teachings are based on the, mm, how do you call it, memorizing. We call it the Nyinju. Nyinju means I memorize everything and then I say it to your ears. I don't say it to anybody. You memorize everything and then, and then I pass it to the next one. Mm. So it's called Nyinju. So it was not just a singular lineage that was not allowed to make it public, but it was also a ear to you know, ear uh, lineage. And then by the time of Taranatha, and due to the size of the Tibet geography, you know, many teachings were about to go e extinct because people don't have a social media platform, right? <laughs> so you have to be a little bit wealthy to receive Dharma. You can't uh, say that I have a pure heart. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to look after your own survival. You, know, you need to go for a very hard journey. You, know, you can't take a sky train. There's no metro. Mm -hmm. So you need to have that all that possibility. And then on the top of that lineage to maintain, it's almost like a two impossible task com combining together. One is people coming together is already challenging. And when the teaching is like ear to ear lineage, ninju, mm. and then that is like the perfect scenario for lineage to disappear. And then so what Taranatha did was that he uh, revived many teachings, many practice, uh, so due to him. So he wrote these down. Yeah, he wrote it down. Mm -hmm. And then also, like an example, the concept of the three years retreat, uh, nowadays we know it, it's relatively new. It's not ancient as we think. And the concept of three years retreat, one monastery start to do it, the other monastery copy it. Mm -hmm. Like an example, you see the one rooftop looks similar, looks nice. Okay, the next one does it similar to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so therefore, there, there became a trend. And that the concept of three years retreat, okay, this lineage is doing like that, that lineage is doing like this. Because if you look back in the in a biography of Milarepa, there's no mention of so-called three years retreat. There's a lifetime retreat, yeah. you know, which is far more mm -hmm. than a retreat. Uh, so we have to understand that, oh, some practice is only allowed in the retreat. Yes, that is made up mm -hmm. in the recent generation. But prior to that, before that, there's a many, because otherwise all the teaching wouldn't spread, mm. you know, because it wouldn't spread to the Gelupa school, it wouldn't spread to the Kajupa school, it wouldn't spread to the Chonang school, it wouldn't spread anywhere, mm. you know, so, so that's that. Yeah. And my main purpose is to uh, bring people to Dharma for physical and the mental well-being, not just giving an impression of, oh, this is a Rinpoche sitting on the high throne. He has the object in his hand, get a blessing, mm -hmm. go back to your home. You know, that impression is good, you know, if we have a culture mentality. But many people who are engaged in Buddhism, we, they don't have a culture background. Mm -hmm. So what they need is they need to have this, some form of, uh, they need to taste the flavor of what is meaning of being a Buddhist and the Dharma practitioner. How, what can you feel within your body and mind? What is the difference before and after? You know, so if they can feel that, do that, right? And then there's no doubt that they will learn further Buddha's teaching, whether whichever the tradition may be. You know, it doesn't mean that they have to stick with me and me only. You know, so so that's that. Thank you, Rumche. Very you're clean. You're welcome. So uh, maybe yoga time, yeah. Yoga time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna have a quick break. Yeah. Uh, change the setup. And then we'll be back in about five minutes and Rinpoche will be demonstrating some of the Naguma yoga. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you, Remember Che. That was historic, it felt actually incredible. Thank you. So that was like, wow. So actually, we've got a heap of questions, mm -hmm. so many questions. And so I'm going to start with a question with the live audience. So please, if you could um, ask your question, 
one question to the organizers. Is this going to go through live online, this question? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, I was wondering how the what you presented tonight relates to the uh, direct experience teachings of uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen. Mm -hmm. How does it relate to the Mahamudra and Dzogchen? You see that when you do the yoga, that if your mind is all, all over the place, then you cannot keep the air for quite a time. So the length of the air um, and the capacity, of course, it can go up to three minutes and so on. And um, it depends on the, the calmness of the mind. So if your mind is like all over the place, obviously your body reacts to it, your air reacts to it, and then you kind of let it go right away. Um, how that is related to the nature of the mind, it is not directly, uh, uh, it's not directly linked to the nature of the mind as if that it's going to trigger. It's not like that. It, you have to continue to do practice. You have to continue to do practice just by doing a one time of the sequence. One time of the session is not going to be enough. You have to receive the, the nature of the mind teaching prior to that as well. A little bit before, a little bit after, a little bit during. So when you receive the nature of the mind teaching, what it happens is that when you do all the physical movement at the end of the sequence, you know, of all, at, at the end of the, all the sequence or somewhere in the middle, your mind goes into a state, a very sense of calmness. This is a very much in a sense of a needless attitude. So then if, when you are, you know, you're bringing that kind of uh, condition with your air and the body and untying the channel, you're bringing that, that condition, isn't it? So as you bring that condition, and then if you have the nature of the mind teaching, and then you bring that into your sense of reflection of thoughts in your mind in that, in, in, in that very subtle moment, and that's how the yoga becomes the part of the Mahamudra or the Dzogchen or the nature of the mind practice, similar to the deity practice, isn't it? Like an example, when we think about the deity practice, it is not simply chanting mantra. The mantra is not the priority, isn't it? The mantra is just part of it so that your speech is not distracted. Visually, you're visualizing the deity. Mind, you're focusing, you know, visually and the mind, you're focusing on the deity. Physical aspect, you're in the meditation posture. When you're three synchronized together, then you experience the subtle state of mind. And then when you reach to the subtle state of mind, then you say, my guru and the deity and myself, we are inseparably one. You think, you reflect, you meditate. And if you have a little bit of med Mahamudra experience or some form of teachings that in front of you, you reflect a little bit to your mind. And then you recognize a little bit, you maintain a little bit and so on. So the yoga is exactly different tool, same element. Different tool? Different tool. Tool. Oh, yes, tool. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one is like doing a lot of physical movement, but at the same time, you're not, you not thinking of something else, right? So even you're physically, you're moving, your mind is very much calm, you're focusing on the breath, you're focusing on the each and every movement, you're not engaging in unnecessary activity or unnecessary speech. You have the, all the principle as a chanting the mantra, as a practicing a deity, right? So, right. but then if you never introduced to the nature of the mind, then it's a little bit difficult to detect and say, I recognize the nature of the mind with that experience that I have, you see? So it's good to have a little bit of nature of the mind teaching, not too much, just a little bit prior. And then when you're able to, you know, transcend yourself into that state of the subtle body, subtle mind experience, then you can enter to the non-duality state relatively there. But, but like previous Kalurambache have mentioned, the nature of the mind, recognizing is one thing, maintaining is, an, maintaining is another, fully realization is another. Mm -hmm. You know, so recognizing all the sentient being, we can recognize it. When we, when we go, when we climb on the mountain, and then we inhale and exhale in that very instant moment, we recognize it. And then every sentient being, when we die, 
when we dissolve all our element into a nothingness, into a blackout, and then we reemerge into a, uh, the extreme clear light, which we call it the mother clear light, right? So that time you can also experience, but when you don't notice it, and then the cycle of life begins again, as you're already in the cycle of life. Thank you. You're welcome. And online. Yeah, online questions. So Rinpoche, they're asking, is this um, yoga we just saw, mm. is it similar to the Salong practice in Bon and Dzogchen? Is I, there similarities or not? I cannot say there's a similarity um, because I, you know, uh, I personally never experienced the Dzogchen yoga practice or the Bon yoga practice. But I think since it is related to the Lord Buddha's teaching, like an example, the Dzogchen or the Chakchen, uh, you know, all linked to the Lord Buddha's teaching. So all the yoga practice that is coming from the, all the great Mahasiddha who practice Buddha Dharma, it's all same, the same goal, same intention, and maybe different movement that comes from their own inspiration and their own quality of mind. And they add a little bit of tweak here yeah. and there, make a little bit of adjustment, add a little bit of extra screw here and there. <laughs> yeah. And then they put a name on the top of that, <laughs> then it becomes so different. But then if you really practice it sincerely, you don't have this idea of, oh, that is separate. Mm. Therefore, it's different. You don't have this sense of against. You know, you have a sense of cherishedness to everything, isn't it? Mm. Like an example, as I have always mentioned, His Holiness Dalai Lama, you know, even he is the greatest, you know, uh, uh, Buddhist teacher throughout our Tibetan history, known to be as a, the great, you know, 14th, right? Uh, but still, even everybody see him as a great 14th, he still received all the teachings from the Dzogchen, Chakchen, and the Gilukpa master, Sachapa master, throughout all the different traditions, right? So there's no sense of separation at that stage. So I think the most important is cherish, practice, keep a mindset open. It's good. Thank you, Mr. Uh, my name um, from 1974 column she gave it to me I wanted to know about death and dying since um, I've had two in the last year ex experiences of almost dying which I'm fine with now but I was wondering is either you or anyone um, in your future you could do a course in this to help us uh, very practical things that we can do while we're dying. Um, and also, like I know when our friend, dear friend Jonathan, who was my fiance, died many years ago, we all read the Bar Bardo book to him. Is there anything, you know, that we can do that will help us in that stage um, uh, that is clear and simple, even for people that aren't great practitioners? Hmm. Uh there's a quick answer to that one, and then a little bit of long answer. The quick answer is that currently I am doing the Bardo uh, teaching uh, recording with the Wisdom publication here. Uh, so, so that's that. And what I'm actually trying to present in that uh, recording uh, video is that people who are new at, as a Buddhist practitioner people who are advanced as a Buddhist practitioner. So the commentary of the Bhartha teaching is going to be based on the Taranatha, uh, you know, the teachings of the Niguma, and then it's going to be based on the actual practice a little bit here and there, just to reflect and to understand the key element of it. Uh, so that's that. And myself, I don't experience the Bhartha myself, but out of devotion and sincerity, I'm going to share. Uh, so that's that. Thank you. And one more thing from Tibet House. When we did the syllable ah with the Naguma Yoga, is the syllable only in this triangle or is it in one, all four of those triangles, the ah? I think regarding that, we can do it some other time. Okay. So just on the course, that will be coming out next year, probably early next year. But we'll, we'll have that. <laughs> um, so online question. So... Um, Someone mentioned that if they tried to do that yoga, they just thought they'll probably end up in hospital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's lots of questions around uh, what if we're elderly or what if we have a disability? Is there a way of doing this type of yoga that's uh, um, more suitable? 
Uh, and I think, uh, I think similar to the previous question and answer, it's going to be recorded in the wisdom uh, uh, publication. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to be demonstrating the full sequence because I want to give something that can be practiced by all ages. Uh, like an example in Bhutan uh, right now, the young kids mm. in the elementary school, they're doing the Nibhuma Yoga as a physical well-being and meditation practice, but they're not doing the whole sequence where you land the hard landing. You did What they do is like only a few sequences where you overcome the agitation, anger, desire, a little bit of subtle movement. So there will be uh, particular one out of 27 sequence, there will be probably at least 10 to 12 sequence that I will offer to the to the audience through the wisdom publication. Thank yeah. you. Ambassador. You're welcome. Hi. Um, can you expand on the connection with the Jonang, Jonangpa school? Mm. Because uh, we, we tend to hear about the fourth school, not the fifth school. So can you explain a bit more about how the connection between the Niguma Yoga and the Jonan. Uh, uh, the Niguma Yoga and the Jonan is basically um, the connection is due to Taranatha himself. So Taranatha is the one that basically Taranatha is uh, one of this great figure who doesn't stay in his own monastery and say, oh, this is my lineage. I receive only empowerment from that particular master. Otherwise, you know, you know, it's a terrible for my head or something. You know, he's not type of uh, figure like that. He read, he's a little bit like a universal figure. Like an example, His Holiness Dalai Lama, wherever there's a precious teachings, wherever there's a rare teaching, he tend to receive it, all of it, regardless of the different traditions and background. And that is the example of previous Kalur Rinpoche as well. He has a many Dharma friend, such as Chadar Rinpoche, and all the other great Nyingma master, like Nyushi Ken and Bache, all these are his Dharma brothers. And they've known each other since Tibet, you know, before the 60s. Um, so Kalo Rinpoche, he, was, he didn't say that, oh, I'm a Shampa, and I'm going to practice only Shampa. But he rather focused on every different uh, figures uh, to receive all the teachings. So Taranatha is known to be like that kind of a figure. And the Shampa practice and the Niguma practice he really brought back to life. And uh, so that's that. Because Taranatha is around the 13th century. And then uh, Chungpunanjo lived around 110 years old. And historically it says 150 years old. But the scholars, they say, eh, it's too long. Uh, make it a little bit more realistic. So 125, 110, right? With the harsh condition still. Um, so uh, Chungpa Nanjo lived relatively old and then there's uh, the seven generations of masters so there's other two masters after the seven generation then it was the Taranatha uh, so that's that uh, yeah so Rinpoche there's a few questions around um, for example is this the yoga you did when you were in your three year retreat mm -hmm. also how long have you how long did it take for you to be able to be proficient at this type of yoga? Uh, I, I think in the retreat was definitely an experience, an experiment. Um, but during the pandemic was the refining stage. Mm. Because when I did the retreat, of course, I was very, I fell in love with the practice mm. because I could feel the differences before and after. And I try all my best not to be attached to it, but I'm very much attached to it. <laughs> uh, so talking about the subtle body and mind, you know, I'm not there yet. I'm very much attached to this idea of Niguma Yoga and what feeling all that. that. Um, so took me 750 sessions uh, within the six months. Mm. So, uh, so that is in the retreat I did twice a day. Usually they do only once a day. So I did twice a day in the three years retreat from the end of the second year until the third and the fourth year because we did the nine, uh, six months extra retreat. Mm -hmm. So it was like two times of you know yoga every day, and and then during the pandemic for six seven months, you know I did seven hundred and fifty sessions mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, all together. So, you know, so I refine it, refine it, refine it, refine it. So it, it depends what your aim is. Mm. And if your aim is just to impersonate somebody, and then, of course, you know, it takes probably one month. Mm. Um, but if you really want to refine, not just the physical aspect, but in the mental aspect, and then that takes time, right? So it depends. Nice. Yeah. Thank you, Rinpoche. Okay. You're welcome. Um, hello, Rinpoche. Um, yes. Sometimes as I'm going about my day, I feel some overwhelming sensations in my body and I will like maybe like go to crave to eat something that like is very sweet or like very tasty or I will like grab my phone and sometimes that will distract me from um, doing whatever it is that I, I would be doing that would be best for me. Um, can the Niguma Yoga help me? get less overwhelmed with these experiences in my body that I have in my everyday life? Absolutely, because it's, a, it's about the mental strength, right? It's about the mental strength that you need to develop. But the definition of the mental strength comes down to the uh, clarity of the mind, you know? And then the clarity of the mind comes down to the judgment, the strength of the judgment. The strength of the judgment comes down to whenever the projection of thought arises in your mind, and how you react to it, that makes the difference between making the decision of doing something terrible for yourself or something good for yourself, or maybe nothing is good also, right? So for me, that helped a lot, you know, for the yoga, because there was a time between the three years retreat, completing the three years retreat in 2008, and until the pandemic, I was traveling around, and it took a toll in my body. Because you always meet different people and they invite you for dinner and lunch. It's impolite to say, oh, I don't have a time for you. And then, of course, you end up, you know, eating a lot. And uh, sometimes you eat with them until midnight, you know, because they ask a lot of questions and it is impolite to leave, you know. And if you say no, and then they will say, oh, look at color, but it's not bodhisattva at all. No compassion. <laughs> so you have to. You have to be kind, you have to be nice, but then you end up destroying your own body and end up shortening your life and ending up not fulfilling your purpose, right? So then during the pandemic, it helped me a lot because everything was online and then I did the yoga every day. So it was very helpful. Yeah. Because like an example, when you eat sweet, when you eat sweet, the sensation of the test, the taste in your tongue Last only for a few seconds, you know, not beyond that. It's not going to last for hours and hours of sweetness overwhelming your brain and mind and life, isn't it? It is actually when you think of it, it is terrible, you know, when you think of how we reflect and imagine of the, the sensation of the taste and how, how much of an impression that gives into our mind and how lack of control we have. You know, we may not have the control over everything. But a little bit of control we have, we need to achieve it, you know, so, yeah. So, Rinpoche, there's a question around, what is the purpose of the depths, the drops? The drops is, uh, it releases the adrenaline. And just to be clear with our online and our present participant, please don't do the bet unless I am there or unless somebody who have done the retreat who knows how to guide appropriately, not by rushing into things. Uh, so please don't do the BEP. That I just want to remind everybody. And the BEP is basically releasing adrenaline in your body, in your yeah. mind. So, so release adrenaline or adenosine? Or? Adrenaline. Adrenaline. Yeah, adrenaline. Yeah. yeah. Like seven times of BEP, eight times of BEP, probably altogether 15 times. It releases adrenaline equivalent to 20 to 30 minutes of running. Oh, wow. And that's the difference I felt in my in my mental level. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Rinpoche, how did you learn the Niguma Yoma, the yoga? Um, did, was it from reading or seeing someone do it? Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't understood all of it spontaneously. If that's mm -hmm. what you're expecting to know. Uh, we, I learned from the retreat master and the retreat mm -hmm. master learned from the previous retreat master. And it goes all the way back to the Taranatha's lineage way of doing things. Yeah. So that's that. <clears throat> there's a question around, are you visualizing while you're doing this yoga practice? 
Um, I'm not visualizing during the yoga practice. I'm just keeping my mind with a sense of awareness. And that's pretty much it. You know, awareness of the breath, awareness of the movement, awareness between the sequence, during the sequence, and maintaining that. That is pretty much uh, the visualization that I do. Hi, yeah. Rinpoche. I was wondering, I have two questions. You can choose to answer one or both. One is, um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the breathing practices, the preparatory or during the Naguma Yoga. Yeah. And the second one is, you spoke about your connection to Naguma and also uh, Mahakala. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the Yidam, like the concept of Yidam, and also how that, how do we find one and how do we, um, or, you know, the basically just the benefit and also how do we choose or how, how does that come about? Yeah. The first question was about how to exhale, inhale, the breath working. So I cannot finish everything about the breath because it is very much detailed way of explaining because it's not simple as it looks. What it actually does is that when I do the sequence, the air that I keep is in my diaphragm. Uh, I keep my air in a diaphragm. And then the, the way I keep it is like you inhale half a millisecond. You keep it in the diaphragm, synchronizing the air and the mind and the muscle of your body together. So you have to bring it up from your pelvis muscle up, not too much to the point where you start to think too much. Because if you think too much about my muscle pulling up like this, then you're losing the very center awareness. So you just, you know, let one percentage of your thought just simply sense the presence of pulling up the pelvic muscle and from the upper body, bringing the pressure down to your diaphragm. If you don't have the upper suppression, uh, suppression uh, sensation or pressure, then the air goes to the head and then it gives the headache. Uh, so, so that's that. Uh, so, so you inhale half a millisecond and then you maintain, you add half a millisecond, maybe five seconds later, six seconds later, you continue the sequence. And then even you cannot continue, you just simply exhale it, let the air all out from your nose, inhale new air, half a millisecond, continue with the physical posture. That is the most important. The physical habit is far more important. The tolerance of your, and the length of your diaphragm will increase slowly, depend on what you eat, how you live your life, what is happening prior to the yoga, all elements combined together. Coming down to the yoga practice, yoga practice, first misconception is I have to choose the yoga. I mean, I have to choose the deity. And that is the incorrect perception. I used to have that as well. You know, like I have to choose one deity, at least like you're in a candy shop that you have to choose one and only get to choose one and one only. Otherwise, it's too bad for your teeth, you know? That's sort of a very limitation. I don't think that is very good in terms of our spiritual aspect. We should practice all the deity, and it will not upset each other's deity at all. Yeah. <laughs> if you manage to upset them, that means they are not enlightened and not worth, not worth practicing at all, you know? So practicing all the deity, receiving all the empowerment, not to the point where you become irresponsible of your life, but receiving whenever it's convenient for you, whether it's teaching, whether it's empowerment, and then just practice all of it. And then eventually you will come down to one deity and they say, oh, this is a practice that reflects everything. You know, then you maintain like that. Because the whole point about the deity is that if you have bodhicitta, refuge, uh, and then <clears throat> purifying your intention, and then the dedication and the creation stage, completion stage, if that is there, and that is there in every category of deity. So long as that is there, then that is good. That is the external foundation. The internal foundation of the deity is like previous color which is teaching, Nangla Ranshi Mepa, Sella Tokpa Mepa, Della Shemba Mepa. Nangla Ranshi Mepa, it means you're visualizing a deity but understanding the relative truth around it. Right? So you don't have a fixated mind like, I am visualizing a deity. If you have a very fixated way of thinking, then the same as, I want to buy this expensive car. Yeah. Nothing else matters. I want that. 
It doesn't bring you happiness nor joy in the present. All right? So, therefore, the way you visualize the deity should not be like, I am visualizing deity. It should be, I am visualizing a deity, but I understand the very appearance of the deity is the relative truth, and the very nature of that is emptiness. Right? And then the second element is sella Parity continues with the visualization, able to detect the distraction, whether it's ordinary distraction, whether it's subtle distraction. Second. Third, you're able to experience bliss and joy, but you have no expectation, no desire from it. Right? So if you have this three in inner element quality, external quality is creation stage, completion stage, refuge, bodhisattva, purifying your intention, dedication, right? And then whatever the deity practice you do, then you can achieve all of it. Mm, very nice. So Vimbaji, this question is um, from a person who's asking, what to do when your faith wavers? Um, my mind is gripped with fear. I sometimes lose faith in the practice and think I'm going insane. So what to do when when you have this anxiety and, and fear and are without faith? If, if you have, a, you know, without faith, I had, uh, you know, time that where I was losing my faith. You know, where I say, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? Is it really working? Is it really beneficial? You know, this is insane. Repeating everything again and again. Is it really worth it? Am I really going to be enlightened? Look at all the great masters, what they have achieved. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. And then there's a something that His Holiness Dalai Lama had mentioned. And he said, if you think you're too small to make a difference, then live with the mosquito. <laughs> yeah. Then you become small, small-minded. <laughs> yes. yeah. you know? So there, there will be a time where there will be a confusion, where there will be a sense of discouragement. And then at that time, try to read the biography of great masters. Not necessarily practice every day, but read the biography of great master. Not so much to do with the, uh, you know, magical powers and all of that, but rather, you know, story somebody who doesn't fly over the sky. Mm -hmm. You know, like an example, there's many great masters who fly over the sky and perform miracles. These are good if you can reflect and use it positively. But if you think these are the priority, then the whole point of reading the namtar, you know, the history becomes incorrect. Mm -hmm. So such as read the biography of the recent masters and previous masters. Mix all together, little bit, little. And if that is not enough, then try to read the, the songs of the Shampa master, you know, the timeless rapture. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. like an example, the song, mm -hmm. like an example, they practice their whole life and they come up with the one page. And nowadays we practice a little bit and then we have a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. And I'm joining that club. <laughs> uh, but uh, many great master, they practice whole life. They have one page, two page. And, uh, and then when you reflect to this teaching, it's very beneficial. Each time you reflect a little bit, it deepens more in terms of understanding. It depends on how you practice. Mm -hmm. They say a yogi can say in a sentence what a scholar takes a whole book to say. So yeah. like that. <laughs> yes, there's something like that. <laughs> um, we have a question from the audience. Thanks yeah. for taking the question, Rinpoche. Um, I don't know exactly know how to uh, put the question, but um, it, speaking of like our uh, cultural moment, um, with in in reference to the two truths of absolute and relative, it, it seems like in the um there's been a you know a shift through the 20th century, but the end of the 20th century, especially the 60s and stuff, um mostly coming out of French theory and into the universities um now. Um where there's um and it seems to be, you know, I it, it's I'm not exactly sure what exactly um some of the texts from that are, you know, taught in the universities are um, difficult to comprehend. And, um, but it does seem to be that there's a big shift towards, you know, relative truth and away from, from absolute truth as if such a thing were even possible to have um, just one of rather than both. And I'm wondering, you know, how does one go about dealing with um 
with with uh, the cultural situation as far as that's concerned because it really does seem like you know everything's being relativized in in a way and it's it's just not uh it doesn't it doesn't seem to be the truth or it doesn't seem to be it seems to be um damaging or you know it's nihilism is kind of taking over and uh people maybe it's despair at the state of the the globalization and the climate change and stuff. I don't know, but um, it's not a good situation. I don't, uh, I don't know. <laughs> that's about as well as I can. Uh, okay. I hope that made some sense. <laughs> yeah. You understand? Machine huh? Machine Okay. Oh, I think the so, point is, is the, that in the cultural moment, yeah. it seems like everything's becoming relative. Okay. Right. So that, um, like this idea of relative truth, but it's also like a nihilism. Okay. That we can't really say anything about anything. I think, and so that can be very disorientating. Okay. So how to deal with this? Is is that close? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense, Rupiche? How to say about what? Anything? So it's hard to say anything definite about anything, right? Yes. So you can, if you are thinking that everything is just relative, Maybe we can say like this: is everything is just empty. Mm -hmm. Then there's a there's a there's a chance that if you take that too far, you'll fall into some nihilistic view, mm -hmm. and that can be disorientating. Ah, okay. In this cultural moment. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I think uh, it is very important to, um, you know, to study, and also to do retreat. You know, so when you do a little bit of solitude retreat, it doesn't mean like a three is retreat, mm -hmm. but there's some form of solitude retreat by yourself. And then uh, when you receive all the different teachings based on the, the practice that you do progressively, and then how you reflect to the non-duality can become uh, more relatable uh, based on the understanding. Otherwise, People nowadays, everybody reads so much about the emptiness and nothingness, you know, and that is not really beneficial. Like an example, I didn't read anything about the nature of the mind until the second year, you know. So the first year I just did my practice and second year I also did my practice only around the end of the second year. Then I see the nature of the mind teachings and so on. Then it was relatable in terms of progressing my uh, Dharma spiritual path. And I recommend or maybe suggest for you to try a little bit like that, you know. Yeah. Thank you, Rinpoche. We're sort of coming to the end of our time, so we'll take a few more questions. Yes, Rinpoche. I'm going to ask you something about the Kagyu lineage. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression that your previous incarnation was Karma Kagyu. Mm -hmm. So I've seen many pictures of him with uh, Karmapa. Mm -hmm. And then today, when I started to research you, um, it you went up into a different lineage tree, so I got confused. Are you both? Okay. Um, my answer to that is quite simple and a little bit long. So please have a tea and relax. <laughs> uh, like I have mentioned, previous color and bouche. You know, it's a great master. And under any circumstance, even I have his name, I don't think of myself as his reincarnation. I'm very fortunate to have his name, to maintain his legacy and his responsibility. But there's never a single moment I consider myself, oh, I'm Kalurumbuche reincarnation. Because I don't see myself in him because he's a great master, great realized being. And he did so many years of retreat. He met so many great masters. You know, me, of course, I did my retreat, but there was a lot of different kind of struggle that I've gone through and different kind of challenges uh, that he haven't faced. Uh, you know, so there's a different kind of path uh, that we had to go through. And there's a different kind of environment that he was grown up in. There's a different kind of environment that I was grown up in. And what happened is like, it goes back to the three years retreat story. Um, when I was in the previous retreat, I read that Shampa lineage, masters, Nigumas, teachings, and all of it. And of course, there's so many other teachings that are there. And for me, from my bottom of my heart, what I felt connected was the Chungpa Nanjus teaching. 
And I didn't know so much about the previous Kalu Rinpoche relating to the Shangpa lineage or what he had done because I was only 14 when I went to three years retreat. Uh, I came out when I was 18. I was touching a Sonic Ericsson when I was going into my retreat, you know, like in 2003 and four. When I came out, there was the first iPhone. I was touching the screen mm -hmm. and I was a little bit like experimental animal or something. You know, when you touch the screen, I was so amazed by all the advancement that it was you know, that has gone through within three years and nine months. And, but in the retreat, I had this deep feeling uh, and a deep determination, including uh, blessings of the protectors and the Dharma practice, all of it that strongly bonded with the Shampa lineage. And then when I came out of the three years retreat in 2008, September, 2008, uh, and I went directly to Sisitu Rinpoche as he is also one of my guru, and then I said to him, Rinpachela, we were having, you know, we were having a conversation together. And that's one of the, that's why I admire and respect Siddha Rinpoche very much, because he's not just the so-called, I'm the guru Rinpoche, but, but he's also very human. And he understands you, he understands your pay, you know, passion, uh, what you really want to do in your life. And if you're confused, he consults with you, you know, he speaks with you. He doesn't say, oh, you're broken this Samaya, or you're bad, or you're a good student or bad student. He doesn't have that kind of orthodox mindset. And he helped me, you know, throughout the, all the stages of my challenges. And during that time, when we were having a, a dinner together, and I said to him, Rinpachela, you know, for the Karmakaraju, there seem to be so many different figures, so important, you know. And I, I find myself very strongly linked with the Shangpa lineage, with the Niguma. And I am determined that I want to uphold and bring the lineage back alive in my lifetime. That's what I want to do in my lifetime. And then Sudhu Rinpoche said, oh, that's very good. That's what your previous Kalu Rinpoche have done. He established all the Shangpa retreat around the world during the 70s and 80s uh, for men and women equally. And uh, so you are doing what he is was doing. So that's good. You should continue just like that. You have my support. Uh, and then, then I requested him again for the Shampa empowerment, which takes like a whole month, transmission, empowerment and everything. And I received that several times from other great masters, but especially from him, I wanted to receive it. It has a historical link because previous Kalu Rinpoche is known as a, uh, how do I say, you know, many different masters, lineage holder, and so on, but especially the Shampa lineage, those who knows it. Externally, everybody knows him as the Kamakaju master and all that, but those who knows him personally and, and the retreat that he oversees, the majority of it, it is the Shampa lineage practice, like a six yogas of Sukhasiddhi, six yogas of Nikuma, starting from Bhutan in during, the, during the 1950s and the 60s. During that time, he was in the Eastern Bhutan, and then passed down to Sonada in the 70s and late mid 60s, and then and slowly, you know, throughout France and then United Kingdom and Canada and United States and so on. Uh, so, in so for me, uh, the retreat is a very essential part of the lineage, and that defines the meaning of the lineage as well. So. Uh, so for me is to maintain and make all the translation available, uh, you know, in the fingertips of the people. So whenever there's a teaching empowerment, there's no translation gap and all the language barrier. And uh, so, so that's that. Yeah. And one other thing. Yes. I'm sure everybody wants to know the answer to this is, um, is your tattoo a mantra? All of it. <laughs> I have a, I have a tattoo, uh, a green tara, and I have other things. And then I had a tattoo, uh, you know, written Tibet, you know, on my back when I met His Holiness Dalai Lama last year uh, in June. And I was so happy to see him and to receive his blessing. And, uh, and I, I spoke with His Holiness Dalai Lama because he was saying, so, uh, you know, so what is your, you know, how's your responsibility and everything? And I said, I oversee the meditation center of previous Kalu Rinpoche. I uphold the lineage of the Shambhakaji tradition. And that's what I do. 
and then you know and that's what i maintain and then his holiness dalai lama said that's very good you should continue just like that mm. you know so i have approval from my boss <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much sure. fortunately we're at the end of our time but I wanted to thank you. It's been such a pleasure and a privilege and an right. honor to have you with us tonight. Nice. And we just, I just wanted to um, ask if you had any you know, final advice for everyone tonight. The final ad advice is that don't grasp into the idea of I need to have only one guru. Just have many guru as possible. Have many teachers as possible. Receive many teachings, many different empowerment as possible. Keep your practice simple as possible. And always try to receive the teachings, empowerment. And when you meet a real Dharma brother and sister and practitioners or a mentor or guru, always have a time to share the experience so that you can progress further rather than showing off. So whenever you have a mentor or your guru, of course, there's a general public teaching, but try to get private teaching as well. Mm -hmm. Like an example, Damga, mm -hmm. special teaching just for you. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's an empowerment, whether it's a general teaching, whether it can be something very simple, try to have that close relation as well mm -hmm. and balance it a little bit. Don't be overly attached to your guru mm -hmm. and then maintain your social life, solitary retreat, mm -hmm. yeah, and then focus on the Dharma teachings. People can always have a jealousy and a lot of competition exist everywhere. Just because people call themselves Buddhist doesn't mean everybody is pure, you know. So don't don't try to have this kind of a very passive, pure mindset. It is great to have it, but keep your relation simple between your teacher and yourself. Keep the Dharma as the bridge in between and keep the circle small as possible when it comes to your spiritual journey. Don't have too many social, you know, the spiritual circle. It's not mm -hmm. really necessary. It will only disorient it rather than encourage you in the long run. And uh, so that's that. And many of you are Buddhist and Dharma enthusiast practitioner. And I'm very joyful uh, for you to, you know, for that, that I see that in you. And please continue your spiritual journey. And please make a long life prayer to His Holiness Dalai Lama and all the great masters around the world, regardless of the different tradition, to benefit all the sentient beings. And uh, I want to thank the Wisdom Publication, Daniel, and then also all the team and our participant here online and our, you know, here present in this Wisdom Publication House. Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you, Member Jay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>